Hello everyone and welcome back to Hearts of Iron 3. I've been away for far too long. Um, haven't really had a chance to, you know, mess around much with much of anything. But uh, got a little bit of spare time on my hands and hope to have a bit more in the future. We'll see exactly how much actually comes out of this. But uh, hey, may as well mess around with it. Um, this is not vanilla anymore, as you could probably tell by the title of the video. We are using a mod called the Historical Probability Project. Sorry, Historical Plausibility Project. Um, it changes a couple of key things while leaving most of the game uh, pretty well intact. Now, we are still going to be taking it slow in this game because, you know, it's just me and I'm slow at things and I like to micromanage everything and blah blah blah. But uh, it'll also give us a chance to go over the, the mechanics, um, as I remember them anyway, um, and sit down and uh, try to re-remember how to play um, both this game and this mod. Um, I used to thoroughly enjoy this mod a whole, whole bunch, um, but, uh, but really just sort of fell off the map there for a little bit, but now I got a little bit more time, so getting back into it. Um, the first thing that... Uh, that I think we are going to do in this video is just like try to wrap our head around everything and uh, and this will probably run on pretty long I'm um, probably episode zero honestly of this one just as we get to the point where we can actually unpause um, I'm not really going to say that uh, you know this is going to be the most riveting of content or anything like that but you guys don't watch my videos for the most riveting of content you I have, honestly have no idea why you guys watch my videos, but hey, you're here, so am I. Let's go. Let's do this thing. Um, so, we need to sort of take stock of what we've got here, and I'm going to sort of cheat and do what I always do, which is just completely disman dismantle all of our headquarter units. This will, like, if we get into a war right, right away, this will sort of hobble us and make it so that... Uh, None of our units get any of their HQ bonuses, which is sort of bad, but I'm sure y'all can understand. But yeah, I don't like having my boats underneath and my planes underneath the uh, theater HQs, so we're going to just take them out of here. Um, and then we're going to delete all of the... Um, Core HQs, Army HQs, Army Core HQs, all of them. They're just going to go away so I can do a complete restructuring and reorganization of the army. Um, and so that we can actually take count of what all we actually have here. So we can figure out what we need to build just to flesh out what we've got. And in the future, to make sure we've got what we need. Um, yet again, I've got a gotta put a little clarification on this I am not practiced in this game I did not do any dry runs or practice runs or anything of the sort uh, so I'm really just kind of flying by the seat of my pants here we will be going over um, a lot of the uh, fun nonsense uh, that uh, that the historical uh, plausibility project that HPP um, adds to the game and uh, and all the neat fun options that they give us uh, okay so I'm going to attach you guys to the first core wonderful now can I fit both of you on the boat I can so we're gonna have the first core be the Konigsberg core under von Klug, I suppose actually yeah let's do this first we'll wait for the game to crap itself for a little bit here and do a complete restructuring of all this stuff. Um, yes. Turn off, auto-assign, unassign all leaders. Boom, done. Easy stuff. Now, we've got really good units, and we need two of them, preferably ones with... Ah, uh, yes, Logistics Wizard. We want you really really high rank if I could put this guy in command of all of our troops that'd be fantastic but I can't so I'm going to back out and put him in control of the East command now we need to find another logistics wizard Cossard over here and he's also got Battlemaster in School of Offense which is pretty neat and put him in command of the Northwest 
otherwise known as the West. Let me change that, actually. Let's see if I can. Boom. Done. Capital. All right. There's that. I don't think we need Von Klug over here, so let's try to find somebody a little bit more respectable for this core. Um, since it's going to be mostly infantry, I don't want to have any battle masters in control um, because their combined arms bonus is really not going to help. Like, it's not going to be relevant at all for the infantry. Um, so, I guess we'll see Ike can go in there. I'm going to pronounce all of these names wrong, and that's just fine. Uh, we got another few infantry divisions over here. There's five. Boom, second core. Boom, let's go. School of Defense and Offense. Awesome. Von Lieb, you get a new core. Great, good stuff. Now, who do we got left? We got some interestingly set up Panzer divisions. We'll create a new core under the 23rd Infantry. And we're just going to attach more units to this third core. Oh, okay. There's that. Third core. Where are you? You're going to be under list. Sure, why not? Got another one. Fourth core. So yeah, Germany at the beginning starts with a very weak army. Um, more than enough to defeat any one of its enemies um, that that immediately border it anyway like Germany one on one could be Czechoslovakia Austria Poland Netherlands Belgium Denmark obviously um, probably would have a real tough time against France but I mean you could probably do it but uh, the the primary difficulty with uh, with Germany this early on is that you will not be fighting just one of your opponents at any given time. If you do end up going to war, it's probably going to be with a whole bunch of other people. So you really need to make sure that when you do declare war, it's going to be on your terms. So all the political maneuvering we are going to be doing is going to be for that purpose. So we've got one, two, three, four. We've got five core. Um, let's start a new army group with the second core called the first army We'll attach four cores to the first army give the fifth core a leader come on you just you just open that screen up You can do it von Kluger sure first army your leader This is going to be the defensive army on the Maginot. So we are now going to select all of them. We've got a whole bunch of uh, infantry divisions without leaders and that's just fine. Um, we are going to put the second corps along this front down here. Do a strategic redeploy if you would. This is nowhere near enough to invade across the Maginot Line, obviously, but it is going to be plenty to hold the Maginot Line. So there's the second core, we've got the first core now. They're gonna hold the north end of the Maginot. Fantastic. See you in St. Wendell. Back to the first army, fourth core. We're going to have you, I don't know, messing around somewhere over here. Come down here to mines. And then... First Army, Fifth Corps. Fifth Corps, come on. You can just chill down here in suit group. Boom, done. Awesome. So we've got you being transported over here. Um, we're going to create another army. Probably I want a full army stationed up here in Konigsberg for the push down into Poland, but we'll see. We'll see what exactly we need. Um, okay, so now we've got another infantry division we can start a uh, regiment with. Um, actually. I sort of want to make sure they are all 
I'm just looking at the uh, total number of men in each division to make sure that I don't need to build any more um, support regiments. Um, and while we're talking about this, this is one of those things that uh, that the historical plausibility project has changed. Um, rather than, and this is one of the things that I really like about it, rather than attaching like an anti-tank battalion to one of your infantry divisions, what you do is you attach a support regiment to one of your infantry divisions. This support regiment includes things like anti-tank, so this adds a heart attack of three, as well as anti-air and um, engineer battalions and all sorts of other stuff that um, would be attached to a normal infantry division. So you don't just build, you don't attach a thousand dedicated anti-tank troops to a regular infantry division. You attach brigades of um, artillery, brigades of anti-tank, uh, brigades of anti-air, if you have rocket artillery, brigades of rocket artillery as well. And you can see these technologies over here, rather than increasing the um, uh, soft attack, toughness, defensiveness, or whatever of our artillery regiments, by researching heavy artillery guns we're increasing the uh, support horse or support truck um, ability at soft attack and toughness, defensiveness. This one would increase heart attack, piercing, and all that stuff. Um, and the way that this is balanced, basically, is that by, uh, by researching this artillery development tech over here, which we do start the game with, you can see our uh, horse-drawn support regiments, uh, sorry, our horse-drawn support battalions, or brigades, whatever. There are two more IC to build. They take up more consumption. Um, and since we're also deploying anti-tank guns into those uh, divisions, we also need to pay for anti-tank guns to be added to those brigades. Same with anti-air guns. And if we wanted to, and I think we probably should, um, the uh, rocket artillery would require yet another IC cost um, to build one of those uh, one of those brigades. So if we go into our brigade attachment, we see that uh, currently build cost in IC is 5.25 over the course of 110 days. If we were to add rocket artillery to that by researching this tech, that would increase um, the build cost by one. So you can see that uh, a country like um, Japan which probably will not be facing, um, a, you know, heavy tanks, can basically ignore anti-tank gun development, never research this technology, and then never deploy anti-tank guns into their support battalions. Meaning they will actually be able to uh, uh, to afford more. They won't need to spend as much um, IC on their uh, on their support, which is pretty neat, pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, we, we do need to make sure that everybody, all of our infantry anyway, are equipped with either the horse or the truck toad. I'm definitely going to go with the horse, horse toad, um, just because of the speed that we're talking about here. Horse toad support regiments have 4 kilometers per hour, maximum speed, and infantry regiment has max speed of 6. Sorry, 4. Can't read. Militia regiments, for some reason, are faster. But yeah, 4. So, we can pair infantry regiments with horse toad, no problem. Truck toad has 13, which means we can pair those with motorized infantry regiments and light armor, and even heavy armor to a certain extent, although that would um, slow down the rest of the division. But that's A-OK -okay to me. We're not going to uh, worry about building stuff just yet. We're not quite done out here. So, we've got interesting light armor regiments. We're just going to add these guys to a core. going to add them to the 6th core. All of them. And we've got motorized infantry regiments over here as well. Um, and then we have another infantry regiment. I suppose we could add them to the 6th Corps and take advantage of yet another one of um, HPP's interesting mechanics, which is we can use the upgrade button over here to upgrade a regular infantry regiment to a light armor, motorized, or cavalry regiment. So it makes it much easier to do a restructuring of your army. Um, for instance, look, I've got all this manpower, all of this industrial capacity already deployed into this uh, 17th Infantry Division. But if I decide I don't actually want the 17th Infantry Division to be an infantry division anymore, I can just click this button and decide, hey, I want you to be motorized infantry, or I want you to be light armor. So I can more easily structure this 6th Corps with the Panzer Divisions 
um, how I want, how I how I think that it would be good. Like I could um, follow this structure: one motorized infantry, two light armor, and a truck-towed support regiment, which would be interesting. Looks like we might as well. These would just be like super light tanks. So let's call this the first light tank. Boom, done. Did that actually? Yes, it did. Okay. And we can just add these guys to the first army for now. And they can go sit over in Frankfurt. Uh, first army, I'm going to attach you to the west. Yep, because the west has this theater. Um, but that's it. That's basically it. We've got this first core over here attached to the east. And uh, that's the entire army that Germany has. Like, they can redeploy that army, and it's a pretty strong army, to, uh, to whatever flank they need. But basically, we are in a position of needing to desperately and quickly build up as quickly as possible. So we've got those transports over there. Uh, yeah, you can just rebase to Kiel. You guys rebase to Kiel. We'll take a look at everybody all at the same time with them. And we've got light fighters, medium bombers, and light fighters mixed together. Everybody just come to Berlin. Just all of you. All of you, come to Berlin. I'll deal with you later, in a, in a bit. So yeah. The plan, I think, right now, anyway, is going to be uh, just a, a standard build-up. Um, the negotiated reoccupation of the Rhineland, which is ahistorical, um, requires that I have 120 brigades currently. Conveniently, I'm deployed at 119. Um, now, this would lose my party organization uh, because we're not doing it by force, you know, we're doing it we're doing it uh, through um, negotiation, and they could turn us down. Um, the other option is to just move troops over here, and I think we'll get a, a decision to do it. Um, another interesting thing about this game, uh, where is it? It is in the politics screen. They have completely changed these laws and added one. They've added international status. So, one interesting thing about the base game is that uh, major cities would provide you with leadership. Leadership's what you use to make officers, to do espionage and diplomatic influence, make spies and all that fun, fun jazz. Um, now that is tied to your international prestige on the world stage. There are also technologies you can research um, to increase that over here in the education tab. It doesn't show anything over here, but it says right here, provides 0.5 leadership per level via strategic effect. So in total, where is that page? We have 19 leadership, 11 from being a major industrial power, one from being a land and naval regional power, two from being an air intermediate power, and four from our total education research. But we can go in here and say, hey, we are currently a major industrial power. What's it going to take for us to get to a great industrial power? Oh, a total IC of at least 200. Or have the New Deal and have a total IC of 120. Well, it looks like right now we have 164 total IC. So we should probably work our little butts off on attempting to get that much IC. Um, so I think early game, a good, uh, a good strategy is to simply build up industrial capacity. So we're going to do five in parallel and probably going to do that 53 months, 31 months, 21 months. We do want to increase our construction practical. Let's do seven. Let's see, six would bring us to 170 and then 176 and then 182, so if we do 10, this would bring us up to 196. 
uh, take up 43 of our industrial capacity, but that would decrease as our construction practical increases, because each, each one of these takes about a year to do right now. So I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to slot that in there. Um, I actually don't want to focus on naval at all. We're going to build the bare minimum we need in terms of supplies. So I'm okay with running the deficit while we're not in a war. Reinforcement I don't care about. Upgrades I don't care about right now. Um, consumer goods, we really just need to keep this at a level that is acceptable. Um, and I think that this will change at a certain point in the future uh, due to an event or something like that. Uh, so we are going to keep that on zero for now. We have plenty of industrial capacity to use. Um, we can already build a nuclear research lab for some reason. Why is that? Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. Oh, here we go. We've already got the first level of nuclear physics research. In fact, we are currently behind time on nuclear physics research. That's okay. We can take a look at that tech and stuff in a bit. Uh, so, let's take a look at these national decisions for right now. Naval models, I really don't have... I don't really care. Um, introduction, I suppose we could, we could go to this. Uh, main features of the mod. You know, let's... Let's go through all of this. Since this is going to be a, an extra long episode anyway, we might as well um, we might as well go through everything and take a look at uh, what all we're going to be dealing with today. Uh, there are certain functions that require a third party to implement properly, a game master, if you will. This role, to, role is played by an artificial country named HPP. The main role of this country is to fire events that need to be fired at a specific date or very close to another event. Due to how the game engine works, this can't be done in the normal way or how it was done in HOI2. H -O Sometimes it will do strange things like annex itself. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> Alright. In Vanilla Hoi 3, laws lower down on the list are usually better than the ones higher up. This is not necessarily the case in HPB. For example, enacting harsher constri conscription laws will have an effect in your economy as you're drawing people away from your factories to serve in your armies instead. Another example would be economic mobilization, which will which also affects the size of your reserve brigades, so increasing this law gives you more IC, but also makes reserves more expensive. It also increases consumer goods demand, so you might even have less free IC in the end that you started with, unless you can suppress the demands of your people. Unfortunately, the behavior of that alarm icon in the upper left can't be modded, so it'll keep bugging you about better laws you could enact. Just try to ignore it. Gotcha. Leadership. Yeah, we talked about that already. Uh, manpower model. You will get manpower from your provinces, but your manpower is no longer measured by your annual gain of newly recruitable young men, but rather by the currently available people fit for service. Every country starts with either standing or drafted. Standing army means your armies are made of professional volunteer soldiers, while drafted means your armies are mostly conscripts called arms. If you have a drafted army, your peacetime manpower levels will be low, but once you're at war, you'll be able to call in your reserves, giving you an almost instant boost of manpower based on your provincial manpower levels. Later on, you can call in even more by extending the draft and, if need be, enacting emergency drafts, which will drain your factories of workers, but will provide you with more manpower. If you have a standing army, you can mobilize before the conflict starts, trying to attract more men to serve in your troops, and also attracting some international attention. If things get really intense later on, you can also enact an emergency draft. Some of these actions are done decisions, others done through law changes. Sounds good. Land doctrines. Yeah, we'll get to the land doctrines... Um, oh, and this is this is neat as well. Infantry weapons have been consolidated into a single tech line. You no longer need to develop the same weapons for cavalry and infantry, nor for militia or garrison. Once you've re researched a new rifle for your infantry, everyone else will get the same rifle, with the exception of militia. The militia always get second-hand weapons, so you don't research weapons for them directly. Instead, when you research new weapons for your regular units, your irregulars get the weapons your regulars had previously. This is handled via an event called redistribution. You should get this event every time you research new small arms or defensive support weapons. Special forces also use the same weapons as your regulars, but you need to do a special project to adapt your weapons for the special needs. To represent this, all three special forces types start with slightly lower stats than infantry, which you can negate by researching the appropriate tech. Sweet. Resources. Uh, yeah, there's no such thing as a cap anymore. You're going to start... Um, Let's see, do we have that? 
yet? No. Okay. So yeah. Um, in HPP, we introduced a new feature to represent storage problems caused by having insane amounts of resources. If your country gathers too much of a single resource type, you will get an event giving you a penalty on producing this resource. And the penalty will gradually increase. The idea is to never have your stockpiles at 999. Politics. Um, yep, okay. So, German Reich. Yep, gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, ending of guarantees. I don't really care about that. Swedish metal to Germany. Uh, sure. Let's see. Yay! Okay, fine, whatever. Um, we are just going to go into the trade screen and click check the automate trade button because I don't really care about that. Um, so yeah, we have plenty of um, industrial capacity available even though we are building 10 factories um, at a time. So I think it would behoove us to take a look at the infrastructure map mode check and see how it's working out that's fine we've got no roads to build can't build roads okay so what are we looking at in terms of an actual army expansion we have the first army over here which does have a um, decent complement we've got four core of infantry one core of tanks although they are fairly light tanks let's stick a leader in charge of here who really yeah uh, sure one least sure um, and I guess we'll stick with this, um, two light, one motorized, and a truck toad support, um, at least for now. So if we go down to here, we can see that we need to build a support regiment for this. And we can't actually use the upgrade command on these guys. Is that because they're moving? No, it's not because they're moving. It's because motorized infantry can't be upgraded into anything. Uh, okay, so I guess we'll just wait for them get down there because we can, we can do this guy we can turn him into truck toad we can turn him into motorized and then turn these two into light armor and there's really no problem with that I suppose we yeah and they're just gonna be slotted down in here and we will pay the difference in industrial capacity between what we have paid already and what we need to pay to, uh, to upgrade them uh, into what we actually need. Um, so this is going to work just fine. Um, and let's leave the motorized division as it is, I suppose, and we'll just build another truck toad support um, as reserves um, to get them attached to our support brigade. So now we need to worry about um, our eastern front. And I think another three core of infantry and one core of tanks should do us just fine. So if we go to our infantry model, Three infantry, one horse to support, fine, as reserves. We've got uh, five for a core, and we need three cores. Three cores? Yeah, to bring us up to four cores of infantry. Yep, that makes sense. So there's our infantry part, and if we look at our panzer, yeah, sure, we'll build another super light. Super, super light core of panzers. You see how darn expensive panzers are, especially compared to to the infantry. So, we will have our first new infantry corps rolling off the line, it looks like, in April of this year, but it will take all the way until July until that uh, first Panzer Corps rolls off the line. And we don't actually have enough IC for all of this, so it looks like our Panzers are going to be waiting just a little bit, at least until uh, these two get finished. Um, in the meantime, we do want to be building more, um, more fighters. I think light fighters will do us well. Um, and I'm actually going to keep those up on top just so that we can keep our uh, practical, light aircraft practical, um, as high as possible so that we can continue to, to churn them out. Um, speaking of practical, I think we are practically done. Ha ha ha. Look at me, I'm so clever. All right, so there's that. Um, yep, I looked at those decisions already. don't really care about them. We go over to the politics screen. You can see we are currently totalitarian system, meaning we have significantly less consumer goods need um, during peacetime and wartime. Our counterintelligence is great. Counter espionage is great. We have slightly less ruling party support, which sort of sucks, but I mean, we are sort of using our boot to stamp down on everybody, so I guess it makes sense. And as a result, partisans are a little bit more uppity 
but what can you do about that? Now we do only have control of 24% of, um, I mean, we have full control over the country's um, politics, but our party is only 24% uh, supported by the population. So we do need to worry about that um, in our intelligence screen. So I think we're going to make our domestic spies top priority. We're gonna do counter espionage on two, support ruling party on two, and raise national unity on one. Um, in terms of enemies, sure, French Republic, Austria, Belgium, I don't really care about Egypt, India, Luxembourg, nope, don't care about them. We'll do the Soviet Union though. Soviet Union on rank two, French Republic on rank one. Um, where's, there they are, okay. Boom, done, easy. We'll see how that works out for us. Uh, what was I looking at? Just, you know, going all over the bloody place. I'm not even worrying about anything. So, right now, it says we have 150% of our um, current officer requirement, which sounds all... Oh, that's what I was doing. It sounds all well and good, um, but because we only actually have one full army deployed on the ground, you know, we only have the first army that's actually fleshed out. So they've got about 174,000 men, and our uh, first corps over here has another 40,000, so we've got just over 200,000 men under arms. So this 150% is great if we don't do an expansion of our army and we literally have a doubling of our army currently in the works right now. So that's going to need to drastically increase, but that is something we can save um, until 1939. So I think we are going to do just that. We're going to provide a token number of leadership points, just one of our leadership points into officers. So we're giving up the ability to research one of these uh, of these texts per day in exchange for that. Um, we do need some diplomatic points um, for influencing other nations. And I do think we should be influencing other nations before we figure out what exactly is going on here uh, with our um, leadership distribution. So we're going to influence Austria because we want to get the Anschluss done as quickly as possible. Uh, currently, the ROC is um, pretty darn close with us, um, as was historical, but I'm not entirely certain that's going to stay that way. Um, we should be influencing Yugoslavia, so let's do that. So that's two for now, which means we're losing two per day, which means we need... We need four. So let's do four plus enough to give us just a little bit extra. Boom. Done. Easy. Espionage, we are going to want some spies, so I think 1.5 would be good. And you can see that doesn't leave us very much in the way of research points to actually do. Um, when we go into the politics screen, this one is where we're getting the majority of our leadership points. If we can get to 200 IC, we will get an extra 2, just right off the bat. If we can get to 350, we'll get up to 15, uh, which means that... An industrial superpower can research four additional things, all else being equal, um, when compared to just a major industrial power. And that's not counting, you know, the other stuff we need to do with our leadership, like officer production and all that stuff. So we're going to take a look at our research now. Um, we are doing fairly well in terms of our air doctrines. Um, I think we're going to focus mostly on air superiority. Um, so we're going to do fighter pilot and ground training. Um, and then we are probably going to worry about um, our interception tactics because increasing this efficiency is pretty nice. Uh, but other than that, I'm really not too worried about, um, you know, like w researching close air support for more morale and close air support. It is really nice for breaking tough positions, but we're going to be worried more about making sure that our troops can attack unmolested rather than... Uh, worrying about bombing someone else into oblivion. That said, we are going to want to research port strikes and naval bombing um, when we are at war with the British, because the Navy is going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, speaking of the Navy, we are going to focus, I think, on sea lane interdiction, convoy raiding, um, and the uh, independent uh, submarine. Uh, you can see we've got pretty good technology with that already, so I'm not sure we need to worry too much about that at all. Um, when we played France, I do remember having major difficulties because I didn't research any of this base operations. 
Uh, this provides a flat 7.5% bonus to the amount of supplies that your naval bases can actually take in. And I believe it might also increase the rate at which your ships are repaired, but I haven't paid nearly enough attention to actually tell if that's what's legitimately happening or not. Um, but this does, like if you get one or two techs into this, all of a sudden you're bringing in 15% more supplies um, out of the same exact naval base. Um, so you can, you can, you know, support an army in the Balkans rather than not support an army in the Balkans. So the land theory and the operational theory is going to look a little bit weird, but it's all controlled via events um, in this mod. Um, you can see that uh, we already have the Great War experience, which gives us nice little bonuses to um, how frequently our generals will decide to do these things in combat. We also have um, already decided on a path to go down. Now we could just be like, okay, yeah, I only want Blitzkrieg concept and elastic defense from this Blitzkrieg tree. But then, uh, sure, I want defense in depth. I want to just hop over to this human wave concept a little bit. Or over here to grand battle plan, or over here to superior firepower. So, what we need to do before we uh, unpause is decide which one we actually want to be able to research for our 1940 operational doctrine. So, this one, Spearhead HQs, would pair pretty well with this other stuff. They reduce the, reduce the delay between attacks, which is fantastic. It allows us to attack much quicker um, and recover much quicker from an attack than our opponents. Um, but the other thing that it does is increase the hard attack, soft attack, toughness of our mechanized support, which is something that we actually don't have the ability to build quite yet, which is fine. Um, but basically, this is going to give us quite a bit of bonuses to our motorized cores, which I, th well, motorized and mechanized. And I think that's a good thing, but it does mean that, like, uh, if we were to go over here to regimental combat teams, all of our horse-drawn and truck-drawn um, support regiments would be that much better. Uh, they would be more expensive, they would cost more manpower, and they would take up more supply, but they'd have much more defensiveness, toughness, soft attack, and heart attack, and air attack. So, um, I mean, it's all about trade-offs here. If you go full-on superior firepower, all of your um, support regiments are going to be just that much better. But if we go full-on Blitzkrieg, all of our mechanized regiments will be that much better, and we will be much more... Um, like, look at all of these combined bonuses for the... Uh, the artillery, the direct fire, the armored, the elastic defense, masterful blitz and blitz, and masterful breakthrough. Like, we get significant bonuses if we go through all of these um, to our um, mechanized and motorized uh, core. So, uh, if we're planning on making armor the center of our army, and I think that is a pretty good idea when you're Germany, uh, you know, building lots of tanks and making them really good, then maybe that's what we should focus on. So, I think we're going to do that. Um, this is where we, you know, train our tank crews and our infantry training. We're all caught up on that, except for special forces and, uh, uh, excuse me, and our artillery training. So I think we are going to pop artillery in there just to give our support regiments that much more organization and morale. Let them continue to fight um, in support of our uh, infantry and tank regiments. Um, uh, here also you can see um, our infantry focus, I believe that's what this is. Yeah, this is our infantry focus and our uh, um, armor focus. So this is the total operational focus of our entire army, and this is our um, individual focus in terms of land doctrine. So within our army, what are we going to focus on when it comes to our concentration? So we are focusing, it seems, on firepower. So we have stronger infantry uh, regiments, but they need more officers and cost more to build. And same with cavalry, mountain, and garrison units. They're stronger, but they need more officers and take longer to build. Specialized firepower, same thing. Infantry, more strength, more officers need um, more expensive to build. And this is the same with motorized and mechanized infantry down here now. And this one is just for mechanized. And we could go over here to artillery support, which would reduce the number of officers we need and increase the morale and decrease the amount of days needed uh, to actually build an infantry regiment, but it would reduce the toughness. 
um, and it would uh, it would decrease the supply width too, which would mean we could fit more infantry divisions in combat at once, which might be interesting. Um, specialist missions uh, give us a ton of really nice bonuses actually in all sorts of weird terrain. So we might be heading over here into the infiltration and maneuver concept. Um, since we are planning on fighting more of a maneuver war, but maybe not with our infantry troops? Infantry motorized and mechanized. I mean, really what this would do is reduce slightly the penalties that we're going to be facing in these types of terrain. So I think we are just going to stick with firepower. We're just going to max out the amount of men we can fit per division. Max out the number of officers we can put in per each division. So our organization is going to be really high. Our defensiveness is, and toughness is going to be really high. And our soft attack is going to be much higher as well. So I think that's good, a good a good idea. Um, we are not building infantry support tanks. Um, so we are really not focused on the cruiser and the cavalry tanks. This was the traditional British idea of, uh, of having tanks mainly be a support for infantry. They weren't supposed to go off on their own, go gallivanting or anything like that. And the big difference in it between British and German tank theory was that uh, the Germans actually thought that tanks could be a, uh, a fist, uh, basically the hammer, and the infantry should be the anvil. So the tanks were supposed to bust through, get around behind, and attack um, the, the enemy front line from behind while the infantry held them in position. So you'd use the hammer to crush the enemy against your anvil. Whereas the British thought that you should use your tanks as basically armored support. So why need, why worry about making a breakthrough and coming around behind your opponent when you could stack your tanks in with your infantry and have a really strong, really hard infantry push. So the infantry support tank concept is all about um, the uh, dedicated IST, uh, the infantry support tank, which you would attach to an infantry division, which would give that division... Um, more organization, more hardness, it would mean that they take less soft attacks. Um, your light armored tanks uh, would be in much the same role and heavy armored would be much in the same role as well. Basically less independent take, uh, tank operations. And then the, uh, the United States came along and they were like, hey, no, we're gonna do like a little bit of both. So they did make tanks that were dedicated, uh, the heavier tanks were dedicated as infantry support. Um, and they had motorized units that followed the medium tanks through breakthroughs and exploited those breakthroughs. Um, very much a combined arms sort of uh, being able to do any job um, sort of army. But I do think that the, uh, the breakthrough with just amazing bonuses to um, normal medium armored and heavy armored tanks and even motorized infantry would be fantastic. So I think we're going to stick with the stuff that they've got um, with respect to that. We do worry about supply transfer cost and supply throughput, um, mainly because of the Russian winter that we're planning on dealing with in the some somewhat distant future. Um, so we will want to keep these up. Um, let's just dedicate one of our IC into this screen at all times. We should be able to keep it fairly fairly up to snuff. I uh, work on industrial efficiency and production. More education is already at 1940 tech, so that is fine. Agriculture is going to give us more manpower. I think that's fantastic to do. Um, we are good on decryption and encryption and mechanical computing. Uh, we will probably want a bunch of energy. Um, and we do want to keep coal to oil conversion and oil refining up. Um, we are currently doing all right on energy, um, but we do want to keep this energy to oil conversion up um, just because it's very unlikely that we'll be able to have a, a consistent source of oil um, in the foreseeable future. So we will want to keep this, um, seeing as how that's going to be the only real way we're going to be getting our, our oil. We'll uh, dedicate one industrial capacity to fighter tech. Um, in terms of bombers, I think we can ignore it for now. Um, yeah, we'll just we'll just worry about this stuff for now. Um, yeah, just the light aircraft. Uh, we can worry about the bombers later when we're actually worried about building bombers. Um, you can see that we are well behind time in terms of the capital ship main armament. We just 
we don't have a big navy, so we don't really need to worry about it. We can, if we want, start researching aircraft carrier, um, but I think we are definitely going to be much more worried about surviving and destroying the enemy on land rather than um, in, the, in the sea. This just means we basically need to give up the sea to the United Kingdom, but we are going to be working on submarine tech. So we'll dedicate one of our industrial capacity to submarines. We'll bring their engines up to snuff. Uh, it is going to increase their fuel, but it's also going to drastically increase their range. And once we do that a couple of times, we'll be able to start building truly modern submarines. Um, and we can start working on sonar as well, just to give them some more, um, some more defense when they're out in the open ocean. And now we come to the meat of the stuff. Um, we can't build mountain infantry, and I don't think we should. We can't build marines, and I don't think we should quite yet. So we can hold off on those for now. Um, we are doing well on engineering equipment. Our assault engineers are fantastic. Bridging equipment and assault weapons are great. Um, we are on time on most of our infantry weapons. I do think we're going to sink a couple into there. Um, we are going to worry about our artillery a little bit just to keep that up to date. Um, in terms of armor, we do want to begin researching the medium tank chassis right away. And I'm actually going to max the uh, priority of that research just because we want to be able to start building our medium tanks right away, right now. Um, I do think we're going to completely ignore infantry support tanks, um, but armored cars are actually really cool for increasing the, um, the truck towed and the mechanized support regiments. Um, so it is actually an important um, thing to, uh, to uh, continue to research, unlike in vanilla, because this makes your um, mechanized um, organization and soft attack that much better. And once we do start building mechanized support regiments, they're actually going to be kind of crap because we won't have any self-propelled anti-air, self-propelled artillery, or um, uh, tank destroyers, or rocket artillery, or anything. All of this will need to be researched before we can actually make our self-propelled support brigades any good. So anything that we can do to increase our truck toad, ah, excuse me, our truck toad support brigades is a good idea and is a good thing. Because this is basically what we're going to be stuck with until we can start fully mechanizing our support regiments. Um, other than that, I think we're going to start researching the truck engine, because that's going to make all of our motorized and uh, uh, truck towed and mechanized movement that much better. And then the light tank chassis will be next, and that is it for research right now. We will revisit that in the near future, I'm sure. Uh, so, let's go over everything once more. We've got the intelligence done. All oh, right, I was going through all of this. Okay, let's take a look at this one at a time. Totalitarian system, we talked about that. Press laws, propaganda. Monthly war exhaustion goes down, good. Uh, drift due to ideological similarity, that's good. It goes down. National unity changes go down. Ruling party support goes up. That pretty much negates the uh, detriment we get from having a totalitarian system, so fantastic. Um, we are currently fully mobilized, uh, but we could be more fully mobilized, apparently. <laughs> um, so we want to get to war economy, but it looks like we need to either be at war or have our neutrality be below 60. Uh, yeah, that looks... that looks like... Yeah, that looks like what we need to do. Reading these little red asterisks is sometimes difficult but that would give us a flat 25 percent bonus to our industrial capacity while at the same time making it a little bit more difficult to get money um, and increase the consumer goods needs i do think we want to push towards more ic because the more things we have on the ground the better um, our industry is currently mixed we could go over to heavy but that drastically increases the consumer goods during peacetime so I wouldn't really want to make that step <clears throat> until, uh, until we're actually at war. And it increases our supply consumption as well. So it might actually be better to stick at mixed industry for a while. Here's another new thing um, with HPP. They actually have taxes. Um, low taxes, decrease the war exhaustion, increase the ruling party support, and uh, 
decrease the money you make. Um, honestly, I don't really see a reason to increase the taxes unless we really, really need more money. Um, and we might need to do that if we need to start buying crude oil from somebody, but that might not even be an option um, in the future, considering the United States is one of our potential enemies. Um, currently, we have a standing army, so uh, if we were a drafted army, we could, would have a big button that lets us uh, basically, in a, in through a decision, draft a whole bunch of people, get a whole big chunk of manpower. But right now, we have a professional army, which is helping our officer recruitment, which is nice. Um, and giving us five starting experience for every unit we build. So that's pretty nice. Um, at some point we're going to need to mobilize for war, but we're not going to worry about that just yet. And we already talked about uh, being a major industrial power. Um, our foreign minister is currently Konstantin von Neurath. Let's see who we've got. Uh, he gives us threat resistance plus 10, drift towards allies. Interesting. I don't, I don't think we want that. Um... Yeah, why would we want that? That's that's real silly. We'll do Goebbels. Yep, there's my new foreign minister. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay, armament minister is Werner von Bloomberg. And you... Bloomberg. You increase the decay... Oh, everybody does. Everybody increases the decay of the educational system techs. Um, but you give us infantry and artillery practical decay, so we'd be able to build more infantry more quickly, which is awesome and great. But I still like the 10% IC bonus. We might need to swap over to a resources bonus at some point in the future, but holy cow, letting us build more stuff with the same amount of factories is great. Um, Wilhelm Frick is our current Minister of Security. He's giving us ruling party support but increasing the partisan efficiency even further. We could go for one of these uh, threat impact guys. That might be nice, just to keep the, the, the international threat down across the board. Or we could do this leadership modifier. <laughs> Have Goebbels again. Okay, well, just thematically, I can't do that. So let's go for uh, Karl Sack. Yeah, Karl Sack. He'll decrease the impact of any uh, nasty things we do. Make sure that other countries, you know, don't think that we're too dangerous, too threatening. Our head of intelligence is a dismal enigma, enigma, excuse me, giving us an espionage bonus, which is pretty nice. Or we could ask for uh, research efficiency, I suppose. Five percent quicker research times across the board. That sounds pretty nice, actually. Let's do that. Uh, our current army chief of staff is Ludwig Beck. Ludwig Beck. Ludwig. Sure. School of Fire Support. Uh, reinforced strands goes up. That's pretty nice. Superior Firepower Doctrine Decay. Don't really care about. So it's really the other stuff that we care about. Let's do the Supply Guy. Logistics Specialist. Sounds good to me. Our current chief of the army is the Decisive Battle Doctrine uh, proponent Werner von Fritsch. Artillery and Human Wave Doctrine. I don't care about... Artillery and Human Wave, which apparently is what Adolf Hitler really loves, but uh, yeah, I really don't care about that. Looks like that's what everybody does except for Ludendorff, who does Superior Firepower Doctrine, which is also not what we're doing. So we're going to go for the Guns and Butter guy, who's just going to make it easier for us to supply our troops. I think that sounds great. Uh, decisive Battle Doctrine is not what we're going for, but that's all that we have. Uh, yeah. We're definitely going for uh, for much more of a uh, convoy rating doctrine, so we'll see about that. All right, Goring, Army Aviation Doctrine. Uh, I think fighter defense is actually what I want. Or a nameless clerk, mostly harmless. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that looks good. Uh, thank you for all this nonsense. Uh, let's take a look. Take a look. Doing fine. Oh, we do need some um, equipment. Like, I'm not going to be stupid and not give the German army any coats to wear. Like, that's just, it's just not going to happen. I'm just, I'm going to queue that up right away. That's fine. That sounds fine. I'm sure we'll have plenty of stuff to research. Um, I believe these are going to go away soon. I'm actually going to unpause, even though this is still technically episode zero. We'll pass, like, a day just to let the intro events 
happen. Uh, more efficient laws can be enacted, except I really don't want high taxes. Um, now, I do need to say, and I will probably say this at the beginning of next episode as well, <clears throat> HPP is notorious for being just a little bit broken, like, in terms of crashes and stuff. So, yeah, here we go. So I do have the autosave interval set to weekly, but we might need to backtrack a little bit here and then and redo stuff. And we should be able to get away with uh, playing on speed three, just to just to let the game, you know, sort of stabilize every every tick. But uh, we'll see. So we have the iron trade blocked by lack of trade route, but we also have this uh, Swedish metal to Germany. So these are right now canceling each other out. This lack of trade route thing. Uh, is it going to actually tell us about it? No, it's not going to actually tell us about it. So, we have negotiated with Sweden to ship iron from over here to over here, down the northern coast to uh, one of our ports down here. And if we go into the resources map mode, we can sort of see. This is the big, big mine um, of, of northern Sweden that uh, Germany is going to be getting a lot of their... Uh, Historically, they got a lot of their really high-quality iron from. Um, but this is, you know, mountains. And this is a much easier, apparently. I don't really know why. Maybe there's a railroad or something. But they buy the Swedish iron, go over to the Norwegian port of Narvik, and take a German ship down the coast of Norway to the northern coast of Germany. And because Norway doesn't like us very much... There are only uh, 25 relations. They're currently not allowing us to travel through the port of Narvik. So uh, so we need to uh, get Norway to like us or, you know, take over Norway. Mm, I wonder which one Germany did. Um, okay, so we are currently faced with one of those choices. We are going for specialized firepower, right? Yeah, firepower focus. Boom, done. Now we have the ability to research this thing. Woo, fantastic. And it also gives us, like, a little bit of points in there, too, to, um, because we're... We're sticking with the uh, uh, firepower focus. It gives us a little bit of a boost in researching this, but that is still a 1940 tech and four years ahead of time. That's a little bit crazy. So it's the second. I think we should go to like the fourth or fifth or something like that, just to make sure that all the introductory events are over, let our troops get into a decent position. Speaking of which, it looks like, yeah, the entire first core has got over here. I'm just gonna move them all into Konigsberg. We'll call that good. So yeah, uh, there's going to be a lot of event spam at the beginning here, um, and I'm sort of wary about turning it up too quickly, like turning the speed up too quickly, because of all of the events that's happening um, all across um, all of the countries. Um, and especially at the beginning here, once, once the war starts, I think that it will get um, much better. So, over here, Tank Doctrine, 1940. Tank Doctrine, Armored Schwerpunkt. All right, Operational Doctrine, 1940. What are you looking at? Uh, Blitzkrieg, yep. Boom, done. So now we've got the ability to research this if we want and research this if we want. We don't want just yet. More efficient laws, just high taxes. I don't really care about that. Ooh, what's all this? Uh, prepare for war. We might be at war in the future. We should start mobilizing our economy and populace to meet the requirements. Well, we can click the button but we gain threat on everybody. That sort of sucks. Uh, 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 da, 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 da. Yeah, sure. Following Germany's signing of the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, the Kriegsmarine modernized the battleship Schlesien's anti-aircraft guns and engines. Modernizing a ship requires time and effort, and the ship won't be available until it's completed. In game terms, the ship will be removed from the map, and its modernized version will be placed in, a, in the production queue. Okay neat. So, these ships. Did I tell you all to move? Oh, I told you to rebase. It didn't actually tell you to move. Great. Okay. Well, where is it? Here's the Schlesen. It is currently a rank 1 battleship. Deutschland class. It has no training, no training, no training, no underway replenishment. It's old. It is old. Honestly, I don't think we want to waste any of our uh, industrial capacity 
on that right now. We're currently building one ship and one submarine, and I'm sure we'll want to expand the submarine flotilla in the future, but I'm not really seeing our, like, Germany's future being on the sea. It might be nice to reconstruct them, but I'm not going to do that just yet. Restructuring the army. Switch between standing and drafted army. No, uh, not yet. I think we're doing okay. I mean, we might want the swap to a drafted army. But I think that this uh, prepare for war thing will give us uh, give us mobilized reserves, will give us more manpower. But we will see. All right, we're going to go another day, I think. And then I will call it good. What are you? Oh, right, you're the upgrading thing. So you don't actually have anybody in you right now, which is interesting. Okay, there's the fourth. We didn't get any events. Empire of Japan is aligning Axis. Republic of China is also aligning Axis. And we have the Graf Spey. Just gonna splat you down there. Call you good to go for now. Yeah. And I'm not going to queue up another another cruiser, even though we probably have fairly good practical. No, actually, we don't. All right. Well, that sucks. We might want to just keep a submarine in uh, in production, just to keep the. Uh, keep the practical up. Let's do that. Let's just keep one in production. Basically the same reason we're building these light fighters over here. How's that going to influence this, I wonder? It looks like it won't influence it too much. I mean, we're not, we're basically not building any tanks right now, which sort of sucks. We're almost building this one at full speed, the 4th Panzer Division, but we're not right now. We are, actually that's not true, we are upgrading the uh, 17th Infantry to a Panzer, um, Panzer Division. Now, I could have just like built another Panzer Division and built one less Infantry Division, but I sort of wanted to do it this way, so whatever, like, sue me. Okay, it is the 8th, I've officially gone over my gone over time limit, so. We are good. We are going to take a break here, and I will see you all in the next video. Thanks very much, guys. Have a good one.